before I start, I really want to thank uh, the anarchist study group here and um, all the good work that's going on here. I live in Philly and it's really inspiring to people on the East Coast to see what's going on, on the West Coast. And I know Seattle Solidarity has been hugely inspirational and influential in um, encouraging people to f do different kinds of direct action in terms of meeting people's needs. So I really want to thank people for um, kicking something off in particular that's inspired a lot of um, other kinds of models um, around the United States. Way before, way before Occupy started. <laughs> Feels like forever ago. Um, and before I start, um, I'm, like I said, I, I'm actually out west for something called the Institute for Anarchist Studies, which is not an institute. It's a collective of people who think that there's a relationship between theory and analysis and history and ideas in terms of changing the world, but that those also have to be tested and there's a relationship. So we fund radical writers. I don't think I have enough flyers, but if you're interested, you can come get one afterward. Um, but we give out grants to radical writers and translators, so I want to encourage all of you to think about writing um, um, people outside of hierarchical institutions of learning or people who think of themselves as writers. The point is to encourage us all to think about the world, to change it. So, um, and we put out a journal which is up there called uh, uh, Perspectives on Anarchist Theory. I'm not part of the journal collective. And um, we do a lot of things like intervening in social spaces around education. And we also do a book series, which is, um, I only brought a few copies of, but if anyone wants them, you can grab them. Um, a beat up copy of the one I did. <laughs> um, and there's two other good ones I just want to mention um, because they're really relevant to this moment. Um, the second one in the series is called Oppose and Propose. And it's about the movement for a new society, which was in Philly in the 1970s. And if you really want to understand some of the precursors for the contemporary moment of Occupy and contemporary anarchism, that book's phenomenal in terms of trying to understand that there's like a tradition within the continent called the United States that speaks to this moment. And that book's really great on that point. Um, and the one that just came out um, is called Really Good Timing, Decolonizing Anarchism, um, a really good title in relation to Occupy, which a lot of people have critiqued for not recognizing in this wording that other peoples have lived on lands before or that occupation isn't always great. Um, we need to deoccupy, decolonize, et cetera. Um, even though I think Occupy's opened up the space to have those conversations, which I actually think is really powerful. But um, Maya's book looks at, uh, the struggle to liberate India and that there's alternatives other than nation states. So I think it's actually, again, another really uh, interesting read to understand what other alternatives are there in the world besides nation states at a time when Occupy is actually questioning the structure of governance. Um, so, okay, so I just wanted to ask how many people um, got involved in Occupy when it first started here? Okay, great. And um, how many of you that got involved at the beginning are still involved in it? <laughs> Oh, actually, that's a fair number. Okay, <laughs> I've been doing a few talks lately, and it's really dramatic the differences. And um, how many got involved like recently in it? And just sort of. Oh, okay. And the last thing is, um, how many people identify as anarchists? Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> and and if you're completely new to anarchism, this isn't meant to really be an intro to anarchist talk. But if it seems confusing or something later, just come up and ask me um, about it. Um, Sort of in a nutshell, I understand anarchism is critiquing all forms of hierarchy and domination um, and trying to come up with um, actual lib practices that move toward a non-hierarchical society or a society that's about balancing what it looks like to be a free individual in a free society and the tension between those two, which actually is exactly what's happening in the spaces of Occupy, which is why um, I'm really excited about Occupy and also it's also really difficult. Um, so I guess I was going to talk for a while and try to look at the relationship between Occupy and anarchism, and anarchism and Occupy, and then as opposed to a question and answer, even though this room is not the most conducive for it, um, I think it'd be nice, people can toss out questions, but I actually think it'd be really good to try as much as we could to have a, a dialogue or a conversation about what this moment means in terms of a different kind of politics or the difficulties of bringing anarchism and Occupy together or, or not. Um, so, while I'm talking, if you have things you think, I mean, I actually think it's nice for other people to also um, put out their ideas. And the reason I do public speaking, I encourage all of you to do it in the tradition of anarchists going around talking to each other and putting ideas out as we test our ideas and reflect and then we go back. And the only reason I like doing spaces like this is because I like taking time out to reflect on what I do so I can go back and do it. And that's why I really would like to have a dialogue because we're only gonna do a better job if we continually question ourselves. Okay, 
So hopefully I can read my notes here. All right, so originally, um, I also really want to thank whoever did the poster, if they're in the room. That was like such a phenomenally great poster, which is up all the way as you're walking up the stairs. And um, I really, what I liked about it was the way um, there's a lone figure looking at kind of weird, beat up spaces. But um, I really, I, I really like it in a way just because it captures kind of the, the, the beauty of us taking over these spaces without sort of, it has this kind of feeling of like space without content in it, which I really liked about Occupy when it first started. Um, so I actually want to, um, I had kind of originally called this talk Occupy Anarchism because I and I want to look at four aspects of how I understand the relationship happening in that. But first, uh, before I say that, the one the precursor to looking at sort of Occupy and Anarchism is um, I really feel like this moment is a phenomenally important moment. Um, it what to me Occupy has done more than anything else is opened up this window onto history where we're actually looking at history as it's happening, and we're part of it, and we're shaping history. And I've never lived in a time that's felt like this before. And I actually don't think there's going to be a time where there's a window of opportunity like this. And I don't like to think of things as opportunities, but there's, there really is this, wind, this historical moment where we can change the course of history <laughs> because the social conditions are ready for the course of history to be changed. But we actually have a role in that. And I don't take that lightly. And so I'm actually glad lots of people kept their hands or put them back up when who's involved in Occupy still because the drop off's pretty phenomenal on people, especially among anarchists. I've actually found the drop off incredibly phenomenal between the exuberance of getting involved and then the impatience of leaving. Um, and so I really want to say that this is, I think, the moment more than ever where we have to kind of be willing to do what it takes, which is often hard and exhausting and involves lots of discomforts and. Um, sacrifice to be involved in it right now. Um, but I also want to bracket this moment in history is kind of happening with Madison um, when people intuitively or accidentally ended up taking over the Capitol building because I think that symbolically represents one of the discontent poles of what created Occupy is that people feel the shared sense without being able to put their finger on it that politics as we as people understand it under liberalism which people use the word democracy, which I always hate, but representative forms that aren't representative anymore um, are not working. <laughs> and it was really powerful to me to see people take over a space that they legally actually could take over. It wasn't actually even illegal to take over the State House of Madison. But the fact that they're occupying the Capitol, really the precursor to occupy, and at one point people were like, this is our house, this is our house, this is our house. And I, it's, it's like this whole, this cry to bring politics back into where it should be. It's like this sort of sphere of what is our, our home, <laughs> us, that we are the political actors. That was really a powerful moment to begin sort of the Occupy moment. And then going into the Arab Spring, where for 18 days, people made an entire city within a city. Millions of people in 18 days formed an entire city when they're also under pressure of being killed and having tanks come and having to set up checkpoints and take care of people who are wounded and feed each other. And then they do things like create art and have an art space and childcare space and set up a recycling system, which made no sense to me. <laughs> there was not a recycling system in Cairo before that. And in 18 days when you're about to potentially be killed and a lot of people were killed, that people thought it was important, as important to recycle things as it was to come up with defense mechanisms is really astonishing. It's this moment when people say, how would it look, how would we want to live in this space of a city that we're reoccupying to occupy in a different way? So I really think that's the, the historical moment that's opening up. And then it comes to the Occupy, which moment with Wall Street, which again, intuitively, people picking Occupy Wall Street is sort of the second pole of Occupy. On the one hand, a discontent with politics and people wanting to reclaim it as their own is a discontent with where capitalism's at right now and a sense that it's not even producing things. Um, it's, it's this thing that's, Capitalism has become this thing you can't even touch. <laughs> it's not actually even real goods. You don't even, you know, at least in the, the United States. It's a sense of capitalism being on Wall Street, being finance. And I, I have some problems, oh, that's a totally different topic we could talk about, but what is capitalism and is it, you know, is it just, I mean, I, I think one of the shortcomings of Occupy is simply focusing on some of the surface phenomena of capitalism, like, oh, if we just deal with the banks, it's gonna be okay. And if we understand capitalism, like in this whole trajectory, it's not just the banks, it is also the factory, and ultimately it's commodification of things like the air, <laughs> um, and cli climate, and 
um, lifestyles and our bodies and love and everything else we think of. And, but there was this also this powerful moment where Occupy Wall Street was this really intuitive, like, capitalism's not working. It's not, it's not feeding us materially, and it's not feeding us emotionally. <laughs> and both those two, to me, create this window. So what's incredible about this window, because it spans the whole globe, and I think it's actually unprecedented in human history, it's a global window onto a history, a social movement from below without almost a sense of what it wants other than it knows it wants to do it itself. <laughs> it's like a series of do-it-yourself revolutions where people are just trying a bunch of things around those two poles of knowing that neither politics is working nor the material world is working. And people are just experimenting at the same time. There's a theorist named George Katsiafikas who's really great. He's putting out a two-volume set, which I'm really excited about, which is coming out about um, uh, movements from below in 10 countries, I think, in, I think it's called Asia's Hidden Uprising, or seek, I forget the, but it's about 10 countries in Asia, which he looks at, um, which have movements from below that we, you know, we usually look to Greece or Chiapas or other places, and so he's going to uncover, but he'd come up with this thing about starting in the 1960s as a theory where there's an eros effect, where when moments happen that they start sweeping around the globe and people get captured and inspired and pick up and borrow from each other, and that there's something about it, and so it's really fitting that Occupy Wall Street, the first thing you, I mean, I was there almost like three days after it started, and most of the signs were about love and, you know, passion and caring and I mean the number of hearts was really phenomenal and people had no language for it other than this kind of really really this eros <laughs> that really was a sense of we just want to love each other we just want to feel this this beauty and inspired by this moment and but what's distinct about this moment I think and again and then I'll move into occupying anarchism and why I think we really 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 need to get involved <laughs> and really really need to bring what anarchists do well to this moment and take that really seriously is it seems to me the first time in human history where there's been this massive global uprising sweeping the world where people have a sense of a shared purpose. Um, and it isn't simply around an identity, whether it's worker or queer or person of color or et cetera, et cetera. This is, a, capitalism has become so spread, so homo, it's created this sort of homogeneous surface. For those of you who have read the book Empire, which was put out 10 years ago um, by Hart Negre, where they were making a claim that sort of capitalism was this like, smooth surface of the world now. To some degree, that isn't, it, it, there's another great book, Crack Capitalism by John Holloway, where he talks about it's not smooth, there's cracks in it, and now we're cracking open these moments even more. But both of them get at the sense that capitalism has so created this commonality of suffering among us that people feel the suffering at the same time in different ways and un unequal ways, but there's some sense of sharedness right now that actually makes the idea of sweeping transformative revolution possible around the world. Revolution in the sense that we might actually be able to crack open capitalism and start dismantling. A kind of a phenomenal time period which unites us in ways. And capitalism has also created an ecological crisis. So even though that's been not as high pitched a part of Occupy, that's clearly like an underlying motif is there's this global crisis that no one's going to be able to escape either. And no one can escape this capitalist suffering that happens under capitalism, even though some people do better than others. And I think the last thing is it about this time period is um, that it's a grand, surprising, wonderful, shared experiment. And everybody's so super excited to learn from each other and be inspired by each other and just try new things and be bold. Um, so someone uh, at Occupy Philly, um, I, where I've been living for, I moved there about a week before, I lived on the West Coast for a couple years, and I moved there the week before, and I didn't know Occupy Philly was starting, so I was involved from the beginning. Um, but it surprised everybody. Um, three or four people called a meeting, and a 1,000 people showed up. And the anarchists were the only ones that knew how to facilitate, so a few of us facilitated the meeting. And all the anarchists were like, oh my god, who are all these people? What are you going to do? We, don't even, we didn't even plan. And then they were like, when do we want to occupy? And everyone's like, you know, we, th we'd set aside some dates, maybe three weeks from now, maybe two weeks ago, and a thousand people were like, tomorrow. You know? <laughs> and it was just so intense. You know, even those of us that love doing this kind of stuff, who hadn't even been prepared to have it happen, were overwhelmed by the sense of like, people who'd never done this just wanted to do it. And the facilitators that day were like, oh, you know, we were about to leave, and they were like, someone was like from the back of this huge hall, they're like, what time are we supposed to meet? And, it was, <laughs> and then everyone's like, oh my god. So we called everyone back. And then someone said, well, how about we'll start at 8 PM? And everyone's like, how about noon? 
And then how about 9, p 9 a.m.? And everyone's like, yeah, yeah. Except for a few of us anarchists who are like, 9 a.m., oh my god, it's in a day. And <laughs> we none of us even wake up that early. And so, but it's just a sense of surprise and boldness. And so it's like this, that is, is startlingly beautiful, too. And we have to keep that sense of surprise. OK, so I'll stop bracketing that, other than to say there's this really unique opportunity that's completely distinct. Um, and one other thing I forgot to say about this part that I think is distinct is this social moment is both created by capitalism and states and where they're at and other issues like ways identity are understood at this historical moment. And they're both antagonistic to that. So we could maybe talk about that. I, the forms of organizing, the things people are upset about, and how we understand capitalism and statecraft and who we are in terms of our bodies and ourselves and our gender and our sex and our sexuality and our, all sorts of other parts of ourselves are all shaped by this moment and we're an, an antagonistic to it in this movement. But the do-it-yourself part of the revolution is actually trying to ask for things that we can't even imagine that are going past that which I want to come back to a little bit at the end of what strategies look like. If we understand capitalism to be at a specific place that's brought about a specific movement, what does that say about specific strategies to get out of the mess we're in, as opposed to what we might think about doing in the 19th century or 20 years ago? OK, so I'll keep track of myself so I don't talk for more than half an hour. Um, OK, so there's, when I, I like the, I kind of like thinking about Occupy Anarchism in four different ways. And maybe we could come back and talk about some of them. Um, the first one is um, occupy itself as an anarchistic space without anarchists, <laughs> in the sense that you could take away, you could have taken away all the anarchists. I, I actually saw some flyer. I don't. I may be criticizing someone in this room, and I mean it's not meant to be a criticism of you. It's of an idea. Um, I saw a flyer, a little zine that was put out by some anarchists in Seattle. I can't remember the name of it today. Um, and yeah. what? Might have been. Tides of flame? Yes. <laughs> Does anyone do the tides of flame? <laughs> um, um, and it had an article talking about Egypt, and it made it sound like th what happened in Cairo and Tahir, where everyone is an anarchist. And I actually think knowing someone who's an anarchist and from Egypt and ran back to Cairo when that started to be with her family and hasn't left since, she and she was she was like, there's almost no anarchists in Egypt. And actually. Who cares? You know, like that's I guess my point of this section <laughs> is what's interesting about this is you have these spaces that become anarchistic in in form from the very beginning. <laughs> so the ways people are thrown into these spaces, there's something about this historical moment when people feel like things aren't working, that the things they're trying to work are things either they've learned to already do through necessity because people have to share houses now with a lot more people than they want to, not because it's cool to live in a collective house, it's because they don't have money and they have to move back in with their parents or their kids or their cousins or three other families or whatever it is. People are doing more ways of sharing and mutual aid and cooperation and decentralized decision making by necessity at this historical moment. Or maybe it's because people are just that's what people do when left to their own devices, or we could have a whole host of reasons why. But I think there's also something about the impulse that's actually connected to this historical moment, where people are coming into this space. And for those of you that have read The Coming Insurrection, which a lot of anarchists really like, I like a lot of parts of it, when they get to the section on what we should do, it was a piece of very influential to anarchists two or three years ago with the student movement called Occupy Everything. <laughs> it was really big in the UC system especially. Um, almost everybody read that or had a beat up copy in their backpack. And when it got to what to do in the coming insurrection, it said, find each other. Go somewhere and find each other. And what the coming insurrection was meant was find the five friends who think exactly like you and look exactly like you and don't talk. You know. And it was really this myopic of like the people you can trust. But Occupy was complete opposite. It's go into this bizarre Zuccotti Plaza and find each other. And you've never even met each other. And you probably don't even like each other. And <laughs> you don't even know why you're there. But it was really powerful. And in a sense, that anarchistic impulse of just if we found each other, it will work, actually seems to work in Occupy. And I realized, actually, accidentally was in New York at the beginning of Occupy, and one of my anarchist friends was like, you've got to come down and see this. is so weird. And it actually was weird, and it was so weird I couldn't leave for the first week until I moved to Philly. <laughs> um, but it was the whole first five days. I was there like the third day, I think it started. People were just making those cardboard signs that we all made. But that was a historical accident because pizzas got delivered. 
because of Egypt sending them to Madison and then people thought to send them to New York. Historical accident of pizza boxes piled high in Zuccotti Square. People were like, pizza boxes, let's make signs. And so people, so I was at one demo, there was thousands of people, the Brooklyn Bridge demo when it was taken over, and I was in the back and it was just all you could see was pizza. Because you know how boxes have <laughs> it was really funny, because everyone was holding up their sign in one direction. Um, but, <laughs> but it was really interesting. People started you know, taking their pizza box and writing, and then they'd put it down on the ground, another person, another person. And it just kept growing and growing. And I was, my friend and I were totally fixated about taking pictures of the signs, because they were misspelled and incoherent and contradicted each other. And most of them were just, you, you, would, you know, I did this thing where I was asking people what their signs meant. People would kind of look at me like I was crazy, and they couldn't even explain their own sign. It was so it was just you're just like, why are people here? And but and so at one point I was taking pictures and I was like stepping over so I wasn't going to step on the pizza boxes. And everyone was like, get away, get away, get away. And it was like as if it was this like kind of sacred space. Everybody it kept growing and people didn't want to move the signs and they wanted you to stay on the outside of it, even though the plaza is incredibly small and was incredibly crowded. And but what I just didn't get, and then in spending like days and days talking to the people there, they kept saying, you don't know how powerful it is to find other people and have conversations and have them write that sign down, and then you can look them in the eye and you can talk to the person about it. And I realized this is like, it's so interesting how a historical moment is shaped by a time when people feel their social space is Facebook. And that's where your sign goes up on Facebook, and you have these disembodied, and suddenly there's real people talking to each other. And as anarchists, we're like, whoa, but we're always in collective spaces having these quirky, you know, collective houses, collective cafes, collective bookstores, collective organizing projects. It's like we find each other all the time, and that's, we know the quality of life feeling. But after five days, I was like, this is why we need a movement. Capitalism has so destroyed us, people don't even remember they can even find each other. <laughs> I mean, it was really intense to me how, but that was right. So not only was this finding each other, this, the, this anarchistic idea of when you bring people into spaces that they make of their own, that they'll really start seeing themselves in them and find themselves and find each other is a very anarchistic notion. But then people started also ask, just kind of saying everything's wrong and the only way we can think to make it right is by each of us trying together to do it. So then people just started asking what they needed and I thought in Wall Street it was especially really quirky because like for instance, like whatever, we have anarchist spaces, we're like, oh, we need some medics, and we need some food, and we need some, you know, facilitators. And in New York, there was like a whole group of smokers, and they had a smokers working group, and they were dumpster diving cigarette butts and putting new cigarettes together, and they were very serious about it. You know, so they had the whole working group. But, and, and I kept going up to working groups and asking, I was like, how did you decide how to do this? You know, like the media group. I was like, how did you guys decide to do the media? And they're like, they looked at me like I was crazy, and they're like, someone brought a generator, and we plugged our Macs into it. And I was like, that, it's so interesting. It wasn't, you know, because we're radicals and we want to make media and the mainstream media is screwed up. It was, it, it was like just simply because the technology was there and they were there. But through the process of like just being there together, you could just see over the four or five days I was there how powerful it was for them to realize we're here together with our Macs books facing each other and we can start collaborating and working and do something that might look like a media that we're making together, together and collaborate. And people finding that themselves in this anarchistic way that we come at it a different way, right? We're like, that's how we organize because we have a purpose. And here's a form without a content. Okay. So I could go through a bunch of other examples, but obviously don't need to. So, um, so I, the last thing I want to say about Occupy, besides people discovering form for themselves and, oh, now we have to make decisions. How are we going to do that? And stumbling through that. Um, and then after Wall Street, obviously, it spread around the country and a lot of anarchists stepped in, which I'll get to in a minute. But in New York, it was really very unfilled with actual anarchists at the beginning. Um, but the other, the other part was that I think there's also this way in which that would never have actually happened if there actually hadn't been real anarchists and real movements that were anarchists in North America. So I actually think there's this really hidden debt, which is increasingly becoming made visible, of all of us who've been anarchists for a long time, or maybe even a short time, multiple generations of anarchists doing things that look like what Occupy Wall Street became and what Occupy has grown into, food not bombs and medics and indie media and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, where we had done all these structures and there's a history to it. Seattle clearly, like the resonance, whether that echoes, I'm curious, actually it would be interesting for me to hear about later, how much echo there is of like Seattle 10 years ago, who remembers that or how that plays into it. But clearly there's lots of practice and history and memory and ground that was built that's indebted to anarchism. Um, that even if people don't know that's in the forefront of their minds, social movements to some degree have a collective history of the histories bef 
that became before them. So that's been really important. And also other social movements that weren't just anarchists. I don't want to just say it's just anarchists because there's plenty of queer feminism, some of which is queer anarchism or not. <laughs> but some of other movements that have come in, you know, uh, in Philly, there's a lot of, you know, radical uh, black social movements or that are very decentralist or anarchistic in certain ways. So it isn't just that anarchists are the only one to discover this, but there's a way in which the whole horizontal zeitgeist of social movements around the globe plays into this moment here too. So um, there's an indebtedness to that that it wouldn't have happened otherwise. Okay, so the first thing is Occupy that's anarchistic, that functions anarchistically, but you actually sort of, it's, it, and largely, the last thing I wanna say is without any goal, <laughs> without any principles, without kind of any reason behind it, other than it just feels good to do this. So um, there was some young hippie woman who was at Occupy Philly at the very beginning, and I kept asking at the beginning, she was just, I kept, I was like the people that I couldn't figure out, I kept asking them, just following them around every few days and asking them why they were there and what they were, how they were feeling, because it really was the phenomenal changes people were going through was mind blowing to me. And the first day I was like, why did, I kept, that was my favorite, why did you show up? And the people, because the other thing is almost 90% of the people in Philly and Wall Street and some of the other occupies that I've been to, which hasn't been a lot, had never ever done politics in their life. So the question for me is, why did you decide to come? And this, this young hippie woman, she's like, I was like, why, why did you come? And she goes, I have no idea. And, I was, and she just babbled on for like 45 minutes and she couldn't explain it. And then she just said, I don't know, when I was, came out of the womb, I just had this feeling that everything was wrong. And I was like, whoa, okay, I don't know how you could, but it was just this really, you know. <laughs> and, but she really was like really intent upon explaining it to me. And she just kept saying, just, I, you know, she couldn't pinpoint. And then she just looked at me and she got really, you know, she goes, she goes, look, everyone keeps getting mad at us because we don't know how to fix this world and we should have some demands. And she goes, she goes if, if it was that easy, things would look different. She goes, I just know it's wrong. And she goes, and what we're doing is together, to Together, trying to figure that out and that's not going to take a like going to be easy that's going to take a long time she goes but it's so beautiful peace love you know and then she went back into the but it was it was actually so right like she almost had no idea and she had no idea where she was going but that actually was okay and I thought actually that's good for me to hear as an anarchist for because as an anarchist I always think I need to know like I need to have values and principles and I need to know what's going to happen and she had no idea except that it was you know and maybe that's okay okay so the second thing in Occupy and Anarchism is, that was the first, Occupy as anarchistic. The second is, um, is anarchy, which I hate. I rarely use that word, um, but I actually want to use it as the way we would find it in a dictionary and as anar some people who identify as anarchists use it instead of anarchism use anarchy. The circle A with the A breaking outside the circle. Um, is chaotic and spontaneous and uncontrollable and non -sub, you know you can't subdue us and subversive and lawless disorderly messy and there's some ways in which that is exactly what occupy is every, i keep for me the word i've used every single day since occupy began is messy and it gets messier and messier and messier every single day and it is anarchy in action <laughs> It is every like possible confusing, confused, disorderly, and that's both its beauty and its horror. <laughs> and if any of you, those of you have been occupied, the number of times that I've cried, the number of times I've screamed, the number of times I've acted poorly in ways I never thought I would act poorly, the number, it's like all, the number of times I've just had no goddamn clue what to do. It's like, it is such an interesting experience. And so those of us who are anarchists, suddenly whether or not we're ever thought of being doing anarchy, we're all doing anarchy. And sometimes it's exactly what's making this moment interesting. <laughs> because it is messy. I never understood this. It is messy to try to transform society. If we thought it was hard to do collectives with anarchists, this is not, I've never used the word messy with anarchists. And now I understand exponentially, it's a complete, it is anarchy. Okay. But there's something right about that. If it wasn't chaotic and confusing and messy and hard, and spontaneous and playful and you don't know what's gonna come next, it also wouldn't be what's kind of drawing us all back and keeping us there. To some degree, that's also why it's wonderful. So how do you do both something that's uncontrollable and messy and hard and confusing and lawless and disorderly and also know that sometimes that's wrong? So even the anarchists that are, it should be anarchy, are actually some of the first people to leave Occupy spaces. Um, but, all, but a lot of the anarchists I know have left for precisely those same reasons. So some of the same things we like, kind of like, you can't control us, everything's uncontrollable. When you're in the spaces of Occupy where there's a crack tent. When we had an encampment, I was part of the media collective. 
the media collective, there were two of us who were anarchists. There was 15 people who weren't. Every single person smoked a cigarette. I thought I was going to die. I don't smoke. And I kept going, could you guys walk out of the tent and smoke? And they're like, you walk out of the tent and smoke. And I'm like, not smoke. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. But, you know, and then there, and then, and next to the tent was a crack tent. So I had a choice of going to the media tent, which I was doing media in and uh, getting lung cancer. Or, and it's just this weird way in which you can't, you know, it's just, it really is, you know, there's tents where people were having non-consensual sex and domestic assault and people fighting. And for a non-violent, quote, movement, I have never seen so many people actually beat each other up and scream each other inside the non-violent space we're creating. Um, we're not going to be violent toward police, but we are actually going to punch each other sometimes, um, which is really intense. And so in this way in which it's not only not a safe space, it's completely unsafe and kooky at times. And that has been really difficult. And I actually think it actually, on the flip side of the interesting parts of it being you know, open, are these really, really completely difficult questions that it raises around what does it look like for us to set boundaries to something that don't contain and control it so much that it becomes not what's beautiful about the occupied? Because there's something in a do-it-yourself world that has to stay open and playful and messy. <laughs> Um, but there's ways in which it has needed boundaries, right? and what does that look like? And I actually think, and I want to come to this in the next section, which is, I'll just because that's pretty self-evident about that, is, um, I'll come back to that at the very end, okay. Because what does that mean to us as anarchists? Like, how do we respond to what that would look like? Um, I was at, uh, for those of you repeating this, I was at a uh, gathering of collective of collective houses in Seattle the other night, and I said this, so I'm repeating myself, but the goal to create um, not safe spaces, but safer spaces is like, how can we make the spaces feel more like there's a, a boundary to what happens, but not lose the spontaneity of this moment and a society in, in formation? That's a really difficult question, I think. Okay. Okay, so the third thing I want to think about, moving away from just Occupy as anarchistic to Occupy as anarchy, um, to is the third is anarchism. Um, this historical moment is showing that anarchism, which I understand to be a political philosophy that's also a practice with the ism that's actually advocating a different form of social organization. That's how I understand anarchism as a political philosophy. Um, so we live under neoliberalism right now, which is a political structure. Um, actually arguing in the United States increasingly, we might actually be able to call it neo-fascism, um, given the National uh, Defense Act and a few other things. But we live under a structure called neoliberalism, but most of us aren't liberals. Doesn't matter if you're a liberal, you still abide by the parameters and the assumptions and the socialization and the structures and the power sources of, of liberalism. Now what we're seeing is societies being created, or, or communities and communities, or cities and cities that are called, when they were encampments, like in Philly, we basically created a 500 person, 600 person, 800 person, depending on how many people were there, town, neighborhood, and complete with everything you needed in the neighborhood in a sense. And within that space, it was anarchism as was the dominant social organization in the space. But most people weren't anarchists. So suddenly you have anarchism without necessarily anarchists inside it. But the interesting part is, as an anarchist, I've always believed that self-organization, self-determination, self-governance, self-management works. But I actually didn't really believe it. <laughs> Into, I, I really realized when it started happening on that scale that I never actually really believed it. <laughs> and then suddenly you see it actually working on a level you've never seen it working before. And it was the most powerful, I think it's for me, it's been the, that's when, what's been most powerful about it, to actually realize that it works. Um, which is actually a pretty profound thing for us to understand um, because there are these values that we've hung on to. Self-organization works. And at the same time, it completely doesn't work. Um, those of you that have been involved in like the GAs, for instance, like I'm completely, my, the core category for me in anarchism is direct democracy. It's like the only way to grapple with power imbalances to my mind is when everybody gets to decide about the world together because power resides in who decides things. That's been really key to my anarchism for years. And then suddenly I'm in this space where the General Assembly's 
are increasingly horrible. They don't work. They don't function. I was actually the person in Philly with one other person who devised our initial outline of what the General Assembly looked like because I'm like, I know how to do this. I've done this a million times. And so, and that, but it, it, sure, what works in a, in a like anarchist bookstore, an anarchist collective household, or it looks far, far different in the messiness of, you know, Ron Paul people and, you know, patri patriarchal guy, conspiracy theorist guys and liberals and peace activists and anarchists and socialists and blah, 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 suddenly thrown into a space together with each other. It's hard. So what, how, what I think is actually good is this isn't that that means anarchism is wrong. I think it's more right than ever. And the reason I think it's right is because even as the GA looks increasingly awful and hard and difficult and confusing to figure out how direct democracy works, the people that were most unfamiliar with it, confused by it, didn't understand why we were doing it, and it took them almost a month to even understand that it felt normal to do it, they're the biggest defenders of it now. And the anarchists have all left. It, in Philly, there was like three, 400 anarchists at the beginning. There's like 10 of us that are still there because everyone's like, this is, doesn't work. It just feels uncomfortable. Blah, blah, blah. And so it actually defies us as anarchists to think about what the problems are. Have we relied on a subculture to make it work? Have we relied on homogeneity? Is homogeneity necessary? Consensus, which I've never been a big fan on a large scale, as I see increasingly, it makes maybe no sense. But what do you do instead? How do you make decisions with people? Like, if you don't have a physical space, do you actually need it? You know, all these questions, which are actually the real questions of what it would look like within anarchism to start thinking about what a social organization would look like. Um, and that's really difficult for us to step into. But the flip side of it is you have people stepping into the space of social organization called anarchism and the profound socialization. To me, what's been the most interesting part of it has been what's almost harder in terms of getting people to self-govern is that it's just so unnatural. So I'll just use uh, one or two examples. At the first General Assembly where there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, that was a one thing I facilitated, and then I ended up doing other things. Um, and I just facilitated, and I was actually didn't say a word of what I thought. And I barely was, I was very background facilitation. And afterward, about 80 people ran up to me and basically thought I ran the entire encampment, and I had requests for everything. And, my, and I was just like, I didn't understand. I was like, kept going, I don't know, you know, I really don't understand this. And it took me three or four weeks after then all these things emerged about there's a conspiracy of people behind the scenes running it. They didn't even know who, I was almost all anarchist facilitating, but nobody knew that because nobody knows what an anarchist, who, you know, what if you've never seen one or most of the anarchists in Philly don't look like <laughs> anarchists. So, um, so, and they weren't telling anyone they were anarchists. So, but it was just this vague conspiracy. And I really finally realized like people have never seen a facilitator before, never been in facilitated meetings. They didn't even understand what the role was, so they were confused. If someone stands up in front of a crowd, they think they must, at a political space, they must have power, which is exactly why I believe in direct democracy to destabilize that. But, but it, even though when they understood what the role of the facilitator was, the deep, deep way we're socialized to respect, respect authority and not question authority and look to authority, even when people understood what a facilitator's role is, they still couldn't get over the fact that facilitators must have some secret role behind the scenes. And even more so, was really mind-boggling to me, the number of people that kept coming up is like, I'm a musician, it'd be really cool if I could play some music. Um, can you tell me how, could you set that up for me? I don't know how to, and I was like, just do it. And they would go, huh? You know, just, just do it. But you can't just say that to some, you know, like just do it is a funny thing when no one's been given the chance in their life to just do it. But then you kind of just let people do it and they figure it out. So it was actually beautiful space letting people figure it out themselves, but the, the socialization part was so intense. But now, three months into it, it's completely the opposite. When the General Assembly, which has gotten down to just kind of the core of liberals, who actually still seem pretty excited about the elections and nation states, but they will defend that General Assembly, you know, this is where we make decisions. So there's a proposal that someone was coming in with something that was to make it, you know, non-directly democratic. And the people that were the most angry, all of a sudden that was the moment I was like, actually this works more than anything, is the people that stood up with the liberals and they're like, we are not going back to the old days of Congress and top down, blah, 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 even though I know for damn well these people are going to vote in the election. And, and the person a couple weeks ago at, who brought a proposal and supported it more than anyone else, that we shouldn't be a political party, we shouldn't be part of electoral politics, we should have nothing to do with the upcoming election, is someone from Occupy who's decided to run to, for Congress because he's been so politicized by this moment. I don't know how he reconciles that in his head, but he's, he's like, Occupy is a social movement. It's completely distinct. It has power. It's us together. 
And, and he's been very good, honestly, I have to say, he drives me crazy. He's been very good about keeping the two really separate. And so that's, in four months, pretty phenomenal that we can get people that far. That social, so, but as an anarchist, I, I really, this would be interesting to talk about. What does it mean when we have spaces where you have anarchism as a social system that starts changing how people act, how people think, what they value? They start getting these power relationships. You don't even need anarchists. And in fact, most anarchists might get annoyed and leave. What does that mean for anarchism in terms of how we actually think it's going to work? How does reciprocity look? How does economics look? How does politics look? Um, Frances Fox Piven came to Occupy Philly and said such a thing that struck me ever since. She said, what's happening in these spaces, I completely agree, is not a protest. She goes, we're creating the new society, and what we're doing is an experiment in a moral economy. Everything we're doing is about how we would make things and produce things and share things and distribute things. And I don't think it's, I'm not that economistic, but I think she's right on a large scale. Like, I kept, it really struck me that everyone was like, oh, I'm not going to my job. I'm doing this for free and being here. But we were doing everything we would actually do to make a society that's our work without getting paid. You know, it wasn't like when people kept saying, get a job. I'm like, this is the hardest thing we have ever done is I'm running a small city. You know, <laughs> and it was really, you know that we're here in the encampment. We were running, we were city managers suddenly overnight, all of us, running whole municipal setups. Everything you need in a city, it's hard work, harder than any work I do for money. And, um, and because there's no end to it, <laughs> and it was a mess. Um, but so there's this way in which people still psychologically need to start thinking that way, and that's going to take profound socialization, and it's going to challenge anarchism. That's really what I want to come to. What does it look like to have a moral economy? What would it look like to go beyond capitalism? And I think our answers have been so inadequate. They've been these like mutual aid, cooperation. You know, we'll, if we, we'll have a house meeting if someone doesn't do the dishes and work it out. That's great until you have 3,000 people and people are fighting each other. Like, what do you do? How, do you, how does that work? That's really actually important for anarchism to think about that. Because this, and I really want to take that seriously now because this is a moment when we actually could start thinking about it as a social system. Okay, and the last thing that I want to talk about with anarchism and Occupy, besides those three things, is the third one is anarchists, us, who are anarchists, who are in this space and how we have acted. And we could probably talk about this all night because there's a whole range of ways people have acted. I've never seen, to some degree, anarchists leap in so quickly because we are the technocrats of, I've realized what, how good we are so skilled at facilitating and you know, mediating and making indie media and doing medics and all the other things. So at least where I was and a lot of the other occupies, I saw anarchists just swooped in and just did everything we do, and we are so good at it. It's like finally all the skills we've been working on for years, there, there's a chance for us to shine. And it really was, it was funny in Philly, like really there were like four or 500 anarchists, and we all were just working for about a week, and suddenly there was a decision at the General Assembly, and we were all working so hard. We just jumped in and did. I really felt like we were all bureaucrats. We jumped in, or not bureaucrats, we were the workers because we knew how to do everything. So we all jumped in and we're all the core of all the working groups doing all the work. And we, none of us were going to the general assemblies because we were too busy. And then there was a general assembly where we'd gone and taken the square without a permit. Thousand people who didn't know each other, who'd never thought about disobeying the law probably. Uh, and they were all like, yeah, we don't need a permit. And then five days later, suddenly they're like, wow, we're in the square, we, might, we should get a permit. And um, because the police and the mayor are telling us to, and which, which they were. And, and so here we all have anarchists are working and there's a general assembly and everyone votes to get a permit with the police standing next to us in our general assembly. And all of us anarchists were like, what the hell? So we, all of us went to a park and then we're suddenly like, wow, there's a lot of us here. And we hadn't actually even noticed that. And we're all like, why did you come? And it was all the same reason, because we're really good at doing this self-organizing stuff. And so we just jumped in. But what we didn't do was jump in as people who took seriously that we're part of this community. And I really feel like it's been an interesting tension with anarchists is we're like, well, we have our posse and crew, and we're gonna, we're not, you know, I like, there's a lot of ways anarchists talk from a subculture, which it's really important to have subcultures, like to get, test yourselves out. But that mentality is this funny way in which, like after that, we did this, that night in the park, we're like, we were all really mad and screaming and getting upset about those idiots down there that had just voted to get a permit, and we're like calling the, I like almost punched someone because they were calling the police to shut down all of Occupy because they thought we hadn't gotten a permit and we were illegal, and you know, and so I was just like, but you're an occupier, why are you calling the police? <laughs> I mean, I didn't almost punch them, but I definitely was like very upset because I was like, you, know, you cannot call the police. But, uh, but we were all, as all anarchists, we were all like getting really upset, and then someone just said, you know, this is our fault we could have spoken at the General Assembly. We could be, and so after that, we did. We're like, this is ridiculous. But I think there's a way in which we're always like us and them or the community, you know. And so that's one thing that I want to bracket about here because it's how we participate. But I also think how our assumptions and our language, 
the way we do politics completely doesn't work in a lot of ways. It doesn't translate. People don't get it. And we haven't gotten how to translate it yet. So there's been this really disjuncture there, too. Um, and yeah, OK, I'm not going to. Running long talking, so I'm just going to cut this part off. But there's a whole bunch of ways it'd be interesting to look at, like how we have not known what to do in this moment. Um, and so for me, it's been this really humbling experience. But I think anarchists have been haven't known what to do. And so, in a lot of places, I think the not knowing what to do means going back to the things we know what to do well. So we'll open an info shop, or in Philly, what's happened is every, pretty much all the anarchists have gone back to the projects they were doing before, because there's a lot of really cool anarchist projects in Philly, which is why I'm there. And you know, it's good. There's prison abolition, and that's good work to be doing. Or, you know, there's running an anarchist bookstore, and that's a good project. Or there's all these projects. But it's like people have just gone back, and they have a place to go. And the people in the space of Occupy who come there, who discover what it feels like to be inside a space that's anarchistic, in a space that's anarchy, and in a space that's functioning as anarchism, it's the most mind-blowing experience for them. Um, so for them, like one guy who's like his 70s at one point after the encampment, he said, you don't understand how it feels. He goes, when I go home at night, it's like exile. He goes, because we have to start, like, why don't we create houses where we all live together, collectives? And everyone in Philly who's an anarchist started laughing because there's probably like 400 anarchist collective houses in Philly. And we're like, he's just discovering, but it really was striking. Like, we realize people don't have anywhere to go back to. And as anarchists, we do. We have our whole anarchist world that we created. And it's kind of like Occupy, but it's a lot more comfortable. And so, um, and you get better food. And so it, it was like this way in which our inability to deal with it has been a problem as an anarchist, but yet we're, we're completely been essential to shaping how things, like in helping things and mentoring things and educating things and organizing. So there's this real tension between us as needed, us as needing to be humble and change, and us needing to step back. Okay. So I just want to try to wrap up in five minutes and then open up for discussion. Because um, I actually think there's actually a lot we could talk about in terms of anarchists within Occupy. Um, and I actually want to say I hope increasingly that this is kind of this interesting moment where maybe we can move toward anarchists without adjectives, much as I think adjectives to some degree are good. Um, but uh, I was at Evergreen yesterday and there was uh, I had this like six hour range or wide ranging conversation with a bunch of uh, Evergreen folks. and. Um, and uh, there was so clear there was little factions of anarchists, you know, and, and they were not going to leave their comfort zones. And it was really intense for me to see. And, but I think that all of us are like, you know, I think there's this way in which we've created these little enclaves and enclaves within anarchism. Um, and it's really hard to challenge our own thinking because almost everything we think isn't working now in terms of being there. Um, and even some of the things we're really good at, like strategies we have. OK. So I want to, in the last five minutes, say it's really important at this historical moment for everybody to be involved, because it feels like a revolutionary moment to overturn capitalism in the state and create maybe a, a world from below. But I think it's actually, I really want to make an argument, it's actually a completely crucial role for anarchists, almost more than anyone right now, in North America particularly. Um, because even though Occupy has come to this moment where now it's acting more in, it's socializing to be more anarchism in certain ways, and in implicitly it's anti-capitalist, implicitly it's anti-statist, implicitly it's questioning the very structure of society. Anarchists, I think, and others from radical movements from below that are interested in social transformation need to come bring out what's explicit about things in a way, bring out the content. So what seems really lacking in Occupy, for instance, is the ability to reflect on what's happened and think about where to go with some idea of where we might want to go. So I've heard lots of people at different occupies, including the Occupy Met. Everyone's talking about, we need to go occupy a space again. We need to go start an encampment again. And it's really interesting. No one ever seems to ask why. What do we want? And maybe that's an old-fashioned way to organize, because that's sort of how I think, is like, we should know what we want. But I, I want to point to a few examples in which, and then I'll end, and we can maybe think about some other ways. In, at a historical moment when there's such an opening for anarchism, Al Jazeera and The Nation just, I think, both wrote pieces discovering Kropotkin. And maybe Kropotkin's right. And, um, and there's some science that just came out that proves everything Kropotkin ever said is right. And so now Al Jazeera, you know. So, but that's a real profound opening. A lot of people are acting like we wanted them to act. And a lot of you know, increasingly major institutions are, and mainstream media and stuff are pretty friendly to anarchism. So let's create this nice friendly moment and actually come out as anarchists and be helping. But there's a way in which our old ways of organizing haven't worked. For me, I'm like, you come out with a big banner that says anti-capitalism, you hand out a lot of piece of literature, you go directly to start, you know, turn people into anti-capitalists. 
But maybe there's a way in which even the way we speak about things, like that's why I really like Francis Fox Piven. What does it look like to talk about a moral economy instead of anti-capitalism? Or to start practicing and try to think about challenging ourselves. So some of the things that people have tried talking to strategically, for instance, have been the general strike. Um, I'm just saying how there's been this debate here and it hasn't passed yet twice. Um, and in Philly, it actually makes no sense because everyone's unemployed um, or doesn't have jobs. Or I, I was just thinking about why is no one even mentioned general strike in Philly, and that's because it's one of the desperately poor cities. Um, and doesn't really probably make sense. But if this historical moment is about new forms of capitalism, there's new forms of labor. Um, I'm in a study group, and we just read a piece by a really um, interesting group of uh, Spanish feminists sort of autonomous Marxists. Uh, they wrote it maybe five or six years ago. It was precarious, uh, de la derive, I can't remember how to pronounce it wrong. Um, but they, they were doing some militant research, and they did this thing where they were like, on a day where there's a general strike in Spain, they said, wait, whenever there's a general strike, a lot of people cook food. And it's usually women or labor that's gendered as feminine. And a lot of people take care of kids. And even if it's all, again, not people, you know, it's, it's definitely gendered female largely. And so there's all this, you know, the kind of critique of all this hidden labor that happens that isn't seen in a strike, which actually puts an extra burden on people that are already not waged oftentimes. And so they did this whole thing where they went out and did this militant research during instead of the strike. But one of their conclusions was that they came up with this concept, for instance, of here's how labor has shifted. Here's what's happening with they were looking through the lens of, of gender and sexuality and precarity and changes to capitalism, really smart pieces. They wrote a series of pieces. And last one, they said, what we need the next time we do a strike, and they tried this, is a caring strike, is making visible all the ways capitalism has actually become ab about people getting paid to take care of each other more than it is about producing things. Like people getting paid to take care of other people's kids or people getting paid to birth other people's children or, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We can think of all the ways in which capitalism has actually taken over the things people used to do because they cared about each other. And so they said, let's actually make visible that a lot of labor that's unpaid is about care. A lot of labor that's actually paid is about care, too. And let's try to create other relationships of caring that transform how we think about social relations. So just an interesting thing for me to say is, like, for us to think about strategies, let's, as even as anarchists, think outside the things we think of that are so kind of, oh, anarchists, the general strike, that's been traditional. you know. But does that actually make sense of this historical moment? That's one thing. A second thing is I really want to point to Occupy Oakland, what they did when they tried to do a move-in day as an interesting strategy. Um, if you haven't read their piece, they didn't work. And you know, we could, whether I think it was a really great idea to take over big space and make a social center. But if you go back and look at, if you haven't read their two-day program of what they want to do with taking over that space for the social center, um, not only did they spend a month or so, and a lot of it was anarchists behind the scenes coming up with it, that's why I'm pointing to this as anarchist role, um, is they spent about how you would take over a building that was much more transparent, that had a reason, that had a bunch of usage, but did a lot of the stuff to kind of both keep it anarchy and also make it feel not as chaotic as anarchy. So when you, they were going to get in the building, they were going to talk about sort of codes of behaviors or diversity of strategies instead of framework first instead of going in and then having everything be messy. They were going to do a bunch of history lessons about uh, racism and prisons as the very first thing. And they were going to do giant meals and music festivals. And they were going to have a slumber party and stay overnight. And all these ways in which they were actually thinking through all the problems that happened with the encampments and the reason of what space you'd want to take and why, and actually trying. And it didn't work. But it's still a really interesting way to think about I want to take another space over in Philly, but what space and why and what are we trying to say? And for us to be a little more, and I feel like anarchists are really good at this, and we need to be really good at you know, doing study groups and creating reflection spaces and trying to find, think of creative ways to bring that back into it. Because I actually want to transform the world in ways in which we actually do get rid of the nation state and capitalism and other forms of hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And so now our role is, again, not to come in as we've come in in the past as anarchists, and to see how we can move into a space that's become a counter to this culture, to really stretch it out to actually transform this whole culture. And that's a really huge thing. So I just want to end on the reason this window has flown open onto history. And what it's done is created not a movement that's called Occupy, not Occupy as a organization, not Occupy as a tactic or a strategy, but Occupy as a space in the most expansive and beautiful sense. That's why I think it's been really profound. It's really intuitively had its finger sort of on the pulse of what's problematic about capitalism, which is capitalism has now taken every space 
and made it private. Even spaces which are called public, public spaces are owned by corporations like Zuccotti Park. <laughs> Um, or the space in Philly, which we took over, is owned by the city. Um, they police it, they manage it, they decide about it, they renovate it, <laughs> they, um, they can kick you off of it. Libraries are being privatized. I mean, every single space you can think of is hierarchically, there's a management structure. Parks have management structures to them. It's like, what space can you think of that's actually neither private nor public with a hierarchical management, but it's actually a commons. A commons means something that we use together with each of us, and we self-manage it, and we self-govern it, and it's really no one's property, it's everyone's property. And there's very few spaces that feel in common. And so Occupy was the fact that it's about physical space is this cry against a world that is not ours anywhere anymore. And that's really not just a physical cry, it's an existential cry. And I think we have to take that space seriously, so the space of Occupy is anywhere anyone wants to make it. Someone in Philly that became part of it, total liberal, never done politics before. She's totally loves, comes to every anarchist event now. She's great. She's really cool. She said, she's like, oh my god, you don't, she goes, this whole thing's just blowing my mind. She goes, I, I went to my office and told all my coworkers about it. Now we're all organizing the office space. And like, that's her Occupy now, you know? And it's like, who cares if she calls it Occupy, whatever the name of her office space is. And there's some, a school district in Philly that they just declared themselves Occupy 440, it was their school district number. And they started trying to shut the school down and take it over and do all these other things. And all of us in Occupy Philly are like, who are those people? They didn't come through our GA. And, <laughs> and, and then we all ran over there and helped them because who cares? So it's this existential space that's opened up in a space of possibility, in a space of people getting their own power. And I think a lot of us in Occupy, those of us who are anarchists of state, are now starting to do this. I've noticed myself doing this in our We're like, but we're Occupy Philly. You know, like, who cares? <laughs> um, so what is it about this moment that's opened up those spaces that we need to step into and in all those places we need to step into and bring things together? Um, at this collective of collectives um, thing that I went to the other night for houses, I don't know the person's here that said this, but I thought it was really interesting. Someone said there who lives in a collective house that they were the only person that was going to occupy and their housemates didn't really understand and they like were there all the time and weren't sleeping at the collective house and probably weren't doing the dishes and all this other stuff. So their housemates were like, what's going on? And, um, but then uh, I thought that person said something really interesting, which was like the space of occupy that they were going into was like this other kind of collectivity. It was this like neighborhood collectivity. It was a like collective of collectives in an, in an encampment. And then they would go back to their collective house. And what are the ways we can think about Occupy creating the space to cross fertilize all these different projects and bring them together and make new connections with things even out of the mess? Um, and that's a really important historical moment to us. Just think about like what does the space of Occupy allow us? And I, I really think we have very little time left, <laughs> in a sense. Like, there'll probably be an upsurge in the spring, but the state and those that have power move in so much faster than we even understand. <laughs> and so I really, really just want to end on urging everybody in every possible way they can think of to, to create spaces where they can create space to reflect on. We've been doing that a lot in Philly, creating our own spaces for us to reflect on how badly we've done things to do things better, which is also important. Um, is do this before that window slams shut <laughs> because it's not something we can open ourselves <laughs> and it's really precious time that if we're really serious about changing the world this is the time for all of us to really think harder and harder and more strategically and go back and dive in there and with everything we've tried to work on and question ourselves more than we've ever questioned ourselves in our lives and be willing to be wrong constantly because this is the moment if we want to make a different world i think we have a chance and i actually think that's what's hopeful about this moment and incredible even if like i've been saying this from the beginning i'm like i know this is going to end how can we keep it going as long as we can and outsmart them and out organize them as long as we can in a way no social movement has ever done globally and everyone was like you're such a downer and i go no that actually gives me hope because i feel like you know things everything ends but it's like what we're going to do in that space of occupy before it ends the world's already different it's not going back to the way it was so how can we make it as different as possible before we get to that point where that window closes on what's possible to change and that's actually pretty remarkable because think about how much has changed in five months it's hard to even imagine the world before that now so Thank you.